students, welcome to the lecture on revenue management and after this lecture we will be able to learn the following objectives. Understand historical and regional context of petroleum industry. Explain petroleum revenue arrangements in context of federal fiscal regime. Define public participation in oil and gas decision making. Discuss economics and petroleum revenue. Let's start with the concept of revenue management. The oil and gas story in India mirrors somewhat the development of federalism in the country. It is a story of incremental steps, learning and experimentation. Both the sector and India's federalism seem more robust today than before, though the evolution of oil and gas policy reflects a centralizing tendency in terms of decision making partnerships and the controls exerted by the center in what, at least for onshore oil and gas, is a state resource, this has inevitably led to tensions. Addressing such key national interests as ensuring energy security and reducing pressures on the balance of payments have been paramount government objectives for the sector. The evolution of oil exploration and production policy since the 50s reveal a controlled opening up of the sector. From the 50s until the early 80s, blocks were awarded only to the two national oil organizations, NOCs, but the government of India started to invite private investment in oil and gas exploration in the late 1970s. Unfortunately, the nine exploration bidding rounds did not see much success. Since 1999, the new Exploration Licensing Policy NELP phase has seen blocks awarded to state and non-state organization, foreign and domestic, on a level playing field. While prior to 1999, oil and gas exploration was almost entirely dominated by the two national oil organization, Oil and Natural Gas Corporation Limited or ONGC and Oil India Limited or OIL, the NELP was designed to attract new investment in oil and gas exploration by many private and joint ventures, JVs, especially Karen Energy Limited and Reliance Industries Limited, RIL. Let us now discuss the historical and regional context of petroleum industry. The evolution of the petroleum industry in India reflects a strong intervention and statist role. A central aim for the sector's policy making in independent India was not to surrender national interests and freedom of functioning. This positioning reflected the perceived need to reduce external dependence for a strategic resource, reduce foreign exchange outflows and indigenize production. The Industrial Policy Resolution of 1956 placed the mineral oil industry in schedule making its development the sole and exclusive responsibility of the state. In 1956, the Oil and Gas Directorate was raised to the status of a commission with enhanced powers. In 1959, this commission was converted into a statutory body further enhancing its powers in planning promoting and implementing program for the development of petroleum resources and the sale of petroleum and petroleum products. In the same year, Oil India Private Limited was incorporated to accelerate exploration and development activities. Pricing Prior to 1975, domestic crude was priced on the basis of import parity. However, in the 27 years from 1975, indigenous crude on the subject to investor prices based on the erroneous assumption that domestic production would increasingly meet total oil demands. At the start, the administered pricing mechanism was based on the long-run social marginal cost of production LRSMC. Until July 1981, domestic offshore crude was priced higher than offshore crude Thereafter, they had the same price. In July 1981, following the second oil shock in 1979, the LRSMC basis of pricing was given up and national oil organizations were allowed an over 200% rise in prices, which still fell short of international prices. Federal System and Constitutional Provisions 
given the specific concerns of India. At the time of independence, the constitution framers developed a sui generis variant of federalism. An effort was made to strike a creative balance between an effective center and empowered states. The Indian model was often referred to as Kasi federal or a federal with a strong centralizing tendency and accused of being a federation but not committed to federalism. The constitution of India stipulated a union of states while the constitutional drafting committee made it clear that though India was to be a federation, the federation was not a result of an agreement of states to join in the federation and therefore no state had a right to cede from it. Clearly, democracy can influence the functioning of a federation over time and India's case, the decline of dominance by the Congress party and the gradual rise of opposition and put particularly regionally based parties have been fundamental. They have brought coalition politics to India with no single party getting a parliamentary majority in the seven general elections since 1989. In contrast, political formations at the state level have tended to coalesce around bipartisan politics. Coalition governments have clearly brought greater visibility to state parties and interests in policy making than was envisaged in the formal federal institutions. Now moving on to the next topic, we will study petroleum revenue arrangements in context of federal fiscal regime. The fiscal regime for oil and gas comprises a number of charges at various stages of development. While most of these are levied by the center, some are levied by the states as well, and some are levied by the center but collected by the states. The key payments made by oil and gas developers into government coffers are profit oil or profit gas, royalties, dead rent, cess income tax, and sales tax. In addition, several other payments are made in the form of fees, license, lease and other expenses, minimum alternate tax, service tax, fines and penalties. Importance of Petroleum in Government Revenue The sector is one of the largest contributors to the Indian Treasury and an important source of revenue for both the centre and the states. Over the period 1980-2000, to 2000, Royalty from offshore oil and, oil and gas cess revenues from oil and gas rose to a peak of 35% of non-tax revenues for the center in 1990 and about 7% of total revenues. Center state sharing of revenue. The various revenues from the upstream petroleum industry are important for both the center and the states. However, both do not benefit equally. The center's share is higher given both the bigger contribution of offshore oil and the large number of central fiscal levies. The data suggests that the ratio has varied over the years. The ratio was most dramatically tilted to the center during the period 1990 to 91 to 1995 to 96 when it was 86 is to 14 in favor of the center. That period was characterized by a higher share of offshore gas with relatively stable shares in offshore versus onshore oil as well as by an increase in oil industry. Royalty The state's main source of revenue from offshore production of crude oil and gas is the royalty. Under the Oil Regulation and Development Act, ORDA, the central government has the authority to fix enhance or reduce the rates of royalty for both onshore and offshore resources. In the current NELP regime, this non-tax revenue is levied at the rate of 12.5% on oil and 10% on gas for onshore areas. In offshore areas, the center receives royalty at the rate of 10% for shallow areas and 5% for deep water. The 20% royalty in pre-NELP onshore blocks is to taper off by 1.5% annually from 2007 to 2008 to reach 12.5% in 5 years to ensure uniformity. Profit Petroleum Profit Petroleum in India has been one of the more contentious sources of revenue from oil and gas. It is split between the central government and the organization or licensee irrespective of whether it is onshore or offshore. 
Under the Petroleum and Natural Gas Rules, an agreement between the central government and the licensee or lessee may contain additional terms and conditions, even where the lesser is a state government, and this provision provides the legal basis for the central government entering into production. In the NELP regime, all gas producers have signed production sharing contracts entitling the center to a share of profit gas either in cash or kind. The relative shares of the government and contractor vary depending on the investment multiple ratio applied to the contractor's cash flow in the year. Oil and gas revenues and center state fiscal transfers receipts of the government of India from oil and gas comprise tax and non-tax revenues and capital receipts while those of the states consist of revenues generated from own sources tax or non-tax instruments on subjects that fall under the domain of state governments as well as transfers from the central government. Transfers are made through three routes. A. Finance Commission FC is appointed every five years by the President of India to review center state finances and recommend on the sharing of devolved taxes and of grants in aid of revenues for the after that five years. In addition, a parallel planning commission makes recommendations on a separate stream of transfers to states for central assistance for state plans that the commission has approved. There are also planned grants given by the central ministries for implementation of their plan schemes. Macroeconomic challenges. India must manage the impact of highly volatile petroleum prices on foreign exchange outflows, on domestic pricing of petroleum products, and on government revenues. Since India imports 70% of its crude oil requirements, when oil prices rise, its oil bill soars. Environmental and social issues. While the environmental and social impact of exploration and production activities is more direct and obvious for onshore activities, offshore development can also have negative impacts for maritime states and local people, especially where these operations are close to the coast. But today, after more than a hundred years of production, the free-flowing crude here is long gone, while plenty of heavy or thick oil remains. Chevron needs to pump hot steam into the ground to thin the oil. This field is 20 to 25 square miles, anywhere from 300 feet to 1,600 feet deep. That's an enormous amount of rock that has to be heated so that this oil will flow at rates that allow us to produce a, a commercial enterprise. It takes 81 trillion BTUs of energy every day just to warm the ground here at Kern. Enough energy to power one large air conditioner for every human being on the planet. In Alaska, BP hopes that a similar technique will help save Prudhoe Bay. They're building giant heaters to warm and soften heavy oil, which is otherwise too thick to recover. Warming oil in the Arctic is no easy trick, but BP hopes it will keep Prudhoe producing for years to come. The difficulty of extracting oil from old fields around the world makes Anwar an appealing target. Over the past century, oil exploration has touched nearly every corner of the globe. There's not a lot of easy oil left to be found, otherwise we would have found it, and that's what we would be targeting. You know, right now we're pushing out to more remote areas, we're pushing out to deeper water, whether it's Gulf of Mexico or even offshore Alaska, and uh, continually looking for larger accumulations. In the Gulf of Mexico, they produce twice as much oil as on Alaska's North Slope. And there's little close to shore that remains untapped. So companies are going further than ever before. Uh, discover deep seas, discover deep seas, Chevron Zero, Charlie Victor. Deep seas, go ahead. Nearly 100 miles offshore, this ship 
is drilling one of the deepest holes ever drilled in the Gulf of Mexico. Chevron is drilling down more than five miles, as deep as Mount Everest is tall, all to look for oil that might be hidden in seven million year old rocks. Let's know the meaning of public participation in oil and gas decision making. Public participation in the Indian environmental decision making process is largely external where policies and decisions are influenced by way of civil society actions and public interest litigation. In the context of resource development projects, the relevant piece of legislation that institutionalizes public participation is the Environment Impact Assessment Notification. Evidence of political protests around the unfairness of rent distribution in resource projects is already common. There already is a rapidly increasing resistance of people who have been displaced and stand to be displaced from development projects. The sense of unfairness involved in the absolutely asymmetric distribution of benefits and losses from such development and the failure to address this frontally will only lead to greater protests. Special rights of indigenous people. Of all the people affected by resource development, indigenous people are often the worst hit on account of the close relationship they share with the land and natural resources. The tribal areas in some of the northeast Indian states have certain autonomous districts and autonomous regions. The regional and the district councils for these regions in the tribal areas of Schedule 4 states have the power to make laws with respect to allotment, occupation or use, or the setting about of land for purposes likely to promote the interests of the inhabitants. These councils are also empowered to access and collect revenue on lands in accordance with the principles followed by the state government. Certain states, including the northeastern hill states of Nagaland and Mizoram, have been granted a special status under the constitution whereby their control over land and natural resources is preserved. In another instance of safeguarding the rights of indigenous people, panchayats or units of governance, at the village level have the power to prevent alienation of land in the scheduled areas and to take appropriate action to restore any unlawfully alienated land or a scheduled tribe. Economics of Petroleum Revenue Petroleum resource rent is defined as the value of the product of a petroleum resource minus all the necessary costs of production, including the minimum returns to capital required prior to the investment decision to induce investment. It is thus the value of the resource to its owner in most, though not all, countries the owner is the state. Since petroleum rent is generated only after all the necessary costs of production have been met, then designing a tax system with rent as the tax base will tend to cause the least possible interference with the investment and production decisions that would have been made if no taxes were imposed. With given petroleum prices, the total amount of rent generated by a petroleum deposit over its life will vary based on to its technical characteristics, reserves, reservoir, characteristics, recovery rates, quality of oil or gas, and other physical factors such as its location, onshore or offshore. If onshore, ease of access and proximity to infrastructure, environmental costs, and ease of disposal of petroleum if offshore water depth and proximity to markets. The fluctuation of petroleum prices will affect the distribution of rents over time. The uncertainty of costs and prices means that rent actually generated may turn out to be much higher or lower than initially expected sometimes. Tax Neutrality An important economic principle in the design of taxes is that taxation should be neutral Neutral in the economic sense means that the tax does not alter the decisions about investment, production, consumption and trade that would be made in the absence of the tax unless the tax is deliberately intended to do so. Neutrality does not require that the same rates and types of tax should be applied to all sectors of economic activity. There are three main reasons why the use of 
special tax systems of the petroleum sector is appropriate and is not a violation of the principle of neutrality. Firstly, the scale of investment required in petroleum exploration and development before any revenue is generated may be such that the risks incurred require special measures to accelerate payback investment recovery if the level of investment warranted by geological conditions and market demand is to be forthcoming. The investor's required rate of return. In the face of uncertainty, expected returns will in practice amount to the investor's assessment of the average of a range of more or less likely outcomes. The price at which investment will be forthcoming is the expected rate of return required by the least demanding investor. The price at which investment capital will be supplied on this definition is determined on the basis of what the investor expects and requires. This point of fundamental importance since it implies that the availability of resource rent and of a base for taxation is not fixed independently of government action. Governments can affect the investor's perception of risk in a variety of ways and can thus affect the determination of the required rate of return. The required rate of return will consist of the expected return from placing the same funds in a riskless investment. Triple A bonds, for example, together with premium for perceived risk in the petroleum project in question and the political risk of investing in the country or jurisdiction where the petroleum deposit is located. Risk here is a combination of pure risk and pure uncertainty. Special factors affecting taxable rent. The magnitude of rent and the proportion that is taxable will depend among other things on the degree of co competition or monopoly in the supply of investment. It is also possible that Kasi rents will have to be paid. These are returns to a factor of production, the supply of which is fixed in the short run but of which increased supply can be generated in the long run in response to the payment of the Kasi rent. The reward to specialist, technical or managerial skills such as those concentrated in large international petroleum organization is sometimes of this nature. Such returns are not available for taxation as petroleum rent without affecting efficiency in the short or medium term. The imposition of rent taxation also has to take into account the degree of risk aversion among investing organization. Saying that a large petroleum organization is risk averse does not mean that it is unwilling to take risks, only that the greater is the risk that it perceives in an investment, the greater will be the reward it requires. A high degree of aversion to risk will increase the risk premium added to the required rate of return. Competition in Petroleum Investment a resource-owning government faces competition from other governments seeking to license petroleum deposits to investors. While the government is a monopolist over individual deposits, it is not a monopolist over close substitutes in other jurisdictions. As a prospect is explored and evaluated, the owner's monopoly position becomes more effective in attracting initial exploration, however, a government clearly faces external competition over the terms of investment from other governments. Setting the price of the resource. The price for petroleum out output and the costs of production cannot be known with certainty in advance. The magnitude of potential rent from a petroleum deposit cannot be determined in advance. Effective resource taxation thus requires devices in the form of conditional payments to tax realized and not forecast rent. The argument is most often used to justify imposition of fairly high royalties on production or on gross revenue. It is fallacious if the price of the resource collected in advance by means of a royalty is not, in the end, part of the surplus over what is needed to reward capital and labor and pay for inputs, it will distort production decisions, lead to waste of petroleum. The possibility that this payment will turn out to be part of the revenue needed to pay for inputs, labor or capital will deter investment at the margin and this effect will be greater the higher is the payment for the resource set in the form of a royalty. For these reasons, 
any royalty whether set in legislation or by bidding or by negotiation will have to be set sufficiently low to avoid the distorting and deterrent effects. If it is thus set at a low rate, it will not be capable of collecting a significant share of windfalls or what should more accurately be termed high levels of realized rent. Stability of the fiscal regime. The balance of advantage in knowledge about the likely value of a deposit will tend to shift from the petroleum organization to the government as a project proceeds. If, however, governments permit investors access to deposits on generous terms only to impose onerous variations in taxes when high returns are actually generated, investors will tend to anticipate such changes and increase their risk premia in the face of heightened political risk. Dissipation and Diversion of Rent Tax policy is not just concerned with dividing a given amount of rent between governments and investors. It is also concerned with making the rent available for division in the first place. Now in the end, let us summarize what we have learned in this lecture. The NELP was designed in recognition of need to step up the investment in exploration to hasten the pace of reserve accretion. The key payments made by oil and gas developers into government coffers or profit oil or profit gas, royalties, dead rent, cess, income tax and sales tax. The center's share is higher given both the bigger contribution of offshore oil and the large number of central fiscal levies. Recepts of the government of India from oil and gas comprise tax and non-tax revenues and capital recepts while those of the states consist of revenues generated from own sources. Oil producing regions have demanded a greater say in decision making with respect to the management of resources and sought compensation for negative environmental and social externalities arising out of onshore oil and gas development. The price for petroleum output and the costs of production are not known with certainty in advance.